trigger warning. This podcast episode features discussions of emotional abuse, body image, and toxic workplaces. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Emotional Abuse is Real. I'm your host, Serene Leeds. I'm a professional writer and storyteller, and I'm so glad you're here. We're continuing the podcast's Toxic Workplace series today with my guest, Brittany Betts. Brittany is a marketing and hospitality professional, as well as a toxic workplace survivor. But as always, before we get into the episode, I have a few quick announcements. First of all, I am beyond thrilled to announce that Emotional Abuse is Real reached a major milestone last week. The podcast now has over 10,000 downloads. I, I'm, still, I'm still processing this news, even though it's been a week. I could not be more grateful to my dedicated listeners from around the world and, of course, to everyone who has appeared as a guest on the podcast so far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So here's your quick reminder to please make sure that you're following me on Instagram at Serene Leads Rights. That's S-A-R-E-N-E-L-E-E-D-S-W-R-I-T-E-S. And also that you're subscribed to this podcast on either Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Also, don't forget to support Emotional Abuse is Real by leaving a five-star rating and by writing a review over on Apple Podcasts. Another way to connect with me and this podcast is through my email list, which you can subscribe to by downloading my free resource, 10 Things I Learned from Getting Paid to Watch TV. This download is a collection of some of my best writing tips and tricks, all of which I learned from covering television. Finally, if you're interested in being a guest on Emotional Abuse is Real, you can always either DM me on Instagram, email me at hello at sereneleadsrights.com, or you can fill out my quick and simple application form. I've left links to my Instagram, email, YouTube channel, the show's application form, and my free download in the show notes. Although I'll be covering toxic workplaces for the next few weeks, this podcast, at its core, will always be a safe space to discuss any form of emotional abuse. On today's episode, I bond with my guest, Brittany Betts, over how easy it can be to spend seven years in a toxic work environment. As a server and bartender at a popular chain restaurant, Brittany regularly found herself judged on her appearance, being threatened with unemployment if she didn't maintain a specific look and weight. Now that she works in a nurturing job, Brittany also shares her insights on the differences between a healthy workplace and a toxic one. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Brittany Betts. Um, hi, my name is Brittany Betts. Um, I am 28 years old and I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I've been in the hospitality industry basically my whole life since I was about 15 years old. Um, and that included bartending, serving, hosting, being a car hop at Sonic. And then now I'm currently in the um, vacation rental industry. So well, welcome. Uh, I know we're here to talk about a specific topic, even though I really want to talk to you about vacation rentals and, of course, <laughs> Nashville, because I haven't been there in 10 years. Yeah, oh, wow. 10 years. <laughs> it's been 10 years, and I loved it there. So anyway, well, thank you so much for being here. And so if you could please uh, share with me your toxic workplace story. Yeah, of course. Um, so when I was about 19 years old, mm -hmm. I started in search for a serving slash bartending position. Um, so it was the restaurant industry. Uh, I started working at this place called Twin Peaks. Um, they have locations all across the U.S. Um, okay. 
started in Texas, some in Florida. Um, I've specifically worked at two different ones. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the experiences was in Florida, and that was a great experience. Um, But the one that I mostly worked at for about seven years was the one um, that's local here in Tennessee. Okay. So. I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you because yeah, I did want to mention that you had a toxic workplace experience for seven years. So did I, I stayed in my toxic workplace for seven years. So I just wanted to give you that little bonding moment. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. Was that the Rolling Stone magazine? Yes. Yep. Yes. yep. Um, yes. Yeah. I listened to that as well. And I was like, oh, wow, we have some some stuff in common. So. <laughs> sure do. <laughs> anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt, please. No, you're okay. Um, so I started there pretty young. Um, and initially, I, I knew what I was signing up for. Um, you have to sign up as a model and basically sign a waiver um, to be able to dress the way that we do and look the way that we do yeah. um, in order to serve food. Um, so I, I was a bit young and impressionable, though. I um, was very shy when I first started. Um, I was so small because I was 19 <laughs> years old. You know, yeah. <laughs> my body yeah. hadn't gone through the changes. Um, but so I worked there for. Um, a few years the first time. And I guess I've always grown up as hard work ethic is important. And my parents really distilled that into me. So I worked as hard as I could, um, picked up as many shifts as I could and, and really put forth my best effort. I was still in college also. So I was kind of doing both. Um, and eventually, um, it just got to this point. I was, getting a little bit older, my body was changing a lot more. Um, I had another, another story of, of trauma. I had lost my brother, um, at about 20 years old. Um, Mm, and I had, thank you. Um, I had lost a ton of weight. Um, Mm -hmm. so I was super, super small. And when I finally was on the journey of self recovery and healing, um, I had started to gain back weight, of course, that I had missed. And, um, of course, when you sign on as a model, um, that can't really happen in their eyes. So, um, yeah, what, what they would do is they would, um, pull you aside, sit you at a booth and tell you, Hey, you've been gaining weight. Um, Mm -hmm. you have 30 days to lose it. And if you don't, you're going to start losing your shifts. Mm -hmm. They're going to start not having any shifts. Basically it's like a soft firing. Um, if you don't lose what you're supposed to, um, and that's kind of when it first began. Um, I started just feeling a little bit differently about that work environment. Um, just because I, I had figured that they'd be more approving and understanding of really all body types. Like not Mm -hmm. everyone has to be super tiny to work at a restaurant like that, um, Mm -hmm. as long as they're working hard and doing what they should be doing. And so I started noticing, um, some of my shifts were being taken, Mm -hmm. some of, um, some of like the best shifts that I would have for really treating my customers with care and getting good reviews. Um, those would be cut short. Mm -hmm. Um, or I would, not get the option to choose which shifts I have the way that they work their floor plan. There is a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I started to let that go. Um, and another year had gone by and I really didn't lose that much weight. I, I remain the same. It's Mm -hmm. harder to lose weight when you're over a certain age. Mm -hmm. Um, so one thing that I started noticing was the favoritism that was going on Mm -hmm. there um, towards not the people that worked hard, of course, um, but the people who looked the part Mm -hmm. more so than others. Yeah. And it wasn't even about makeup or hair or any of that because I did that, but it was about size. And um, I started working double shifts Mm -hmm. and with that being said, like you're supposed to have breaks, you're supposed to be able to have lunch during your shifts. And they didn't really prioritize that ever. Um, 
And so there was a little space in the back room where like the dressing room was. Mm -hmm. And that was technically our allotted place to eat. Um, So I would eat back there, but the words of you're still gaining weight, you still need to look better. You still need to improve all while Mm -hmm. I'm eating lunch, feeling like I'm being watched and also having to stare at myself in a mirror at the same time was just, it was really hard. And sure. Yeah. I wanted to stay there um, because it was good money. I was afraid to leave. Mm-hmm. I was comfortable. And I think I think with something like a toxic workplace, um, there's, there's <laughs> pros that you're trying to find the entire time that kind of keep you hanging on by a thread mm-hmm. until that final thing kind of pushes you to the edge. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... I hung on for about two more years, Mm -hmm. always thinking that I'm being watched while I ate, always thinking that I had to lose weight and my self image and my body issues, just, they were at an all time low. Mm -hmm. Um, and so about three months before I left, um, it was, taking a toll on how I was reacting with some of the customers, Mm -hmm. with some of the other coworkers that were getting that favoritism, the customers starting to say, Hey, you gained weight or, Hey, I agree with your boss or, (sighs) or saying certain things to you. I I think that it wasn't only toxic because of like the managers belittling the, the staff, but also the customers were very toxic and it was the same customers that would come in every single day. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, it was harassment every day. Mm -hmm. Um, so it it was hard to take. And then three months before, um, I had changed my hair. Mm -hmm. I had added like some coloring to my hair. I've noticed Mm -hmm. some of the other girls were doing it and I had never colored my hair before (laughs) because I was scared that they would tell me that I would get fired. Yeah. And um, finally I did it and um, they started taking away more shifts and um, basically they said I needed to change it back or else I was fired. And um, (sighs) yeah, it it, it was very interesting because one of my best friends, she had just dyed her hair the same color the week before, um, but she looks like what they want and um, Mm -hmm. they never told her to dye her hair back. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was just me. Um, and so that, and then, um, the following like week or something, I wasn't wearing the right, um, belt that they Mm -hmm. liked. Mm -hmm. And they said, if I didn't show up with the right one the following week, then they would continue to not schedule me and it was going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I cried in the bathroom and, Mm -hmm. um, I basically just came out. I was shaking. I'm not good with confrontation at all. Um, (laughs) We get that. Yeah, especially when you have a company like that that always tells you that you're doing something wrong when you're Mm -hmm. working as hard as you can, you know? Yeah. Um, So I came into the bathroom after I cried. I um, grabbed a piece of paper and Mm -hmm. I put in my two weeks and my boss asked me why. (laughs) 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 And... (laughs) And um, they tried to get me to stay because they knew that I was one of the hardest workers there. Mm -hmm. And I just looked at them and I, Mm -hmm. I, I just couldn't do it anymore. I was crying every single day. I felt terrible about myself and yet they still were wondering why I was deciding to leave. It just seemed like a very, um, almost like, almost like they were gaslighting me into like, Oh, you shouldn't feel the way that you're feeling. You shouldn't like want to leave. Mm -hmm. Um, just the way that they said it and the way that they, you know, talked to everybody, it was just a weird situation. So, um, so basically, yeah, I worked there for seven years. Mm -hmm. I, um, was at an all time low. I was very depressed. I started going to therapy once a week and, um, It took me two years to muster up the courage to finally leave and hit my breaking point. Um, And then I left, um, which leads me to that was my toxic part, the aftermath of leaving. Yeah. 
Um, when I left, uh, I luckily had a very, very supportive partner um, that saw how hurt I was going into work. Mm -hmm. And he said, leave and I'll support you, whatever you want to do financially, mentally, like I'm here for you. And um, that really meant a lot to me. So I, I left with no job, no inkling of what I could do um, or if a place was going to hire me. I was about 25, leaning on 26 years old at this point, um, mm -hmm. and I didn't have any other work experience. And so I was just going th through a lot. Um, I think that mentally I was in a bad place because I didn't feel good enough to even try to apply to places. Mm -hmm. Um, after I had been belittled so much previously, um, I felt like I was lost. Um, when you hold on to something for so long and you're so comfortable with it, the letting go, even if it's toxic, is one of the hardest processes, I feel like. It's true. You know? Um, and then there, of course, was the Cash 22 of... I'm leaving a place that made me feel bad all the time, but I also got every single day I felt a little bit better because a customer told me that I looked pretty or a customer told yeah. me that, you know, and so I wasn't having that anymore. I was just left with the bad self image that was still lingering rather than the good things that I could have taken from it. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so, all, of a, all of a sudden, it was completely up to you to tell yourself, I look beautiful. Yeah. And that's that's hard. It's that's a, hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a hard thing to do. And like my therapist would also say things like you should write little things on the mirror or tell yourself. <laughs> sure. <you know? laughs> um, but it's, it's much easier said than done. Um, yes. You can tell yourself you're beautiful a million times. And um, at the end of the day, that one – or two lingering comments of, of things that have been said in the past will stay with you. So, um, so yeah, that's my toxic story. I have yeah. a good positive that I got from it, which you can ask about, or I can go into, but yeah, yeah. I'm going to just ask you a couple of questions and we are, we are going to move into that. Well, first, before I go into the questions, I want to say thank you so much for sharing this story. Uh, it's, I know it is going to benefit listeners because this kind of behavior, it happens in all kinds of businesses. And the fact that in this particular case, it was about body image. I mean, that's, that's incredibly egregious, although not surprising. Um, so would you say, and I don't know if you know this, was this a chain wide problem or was it this particular location? Yeah. So I, I did happen to work at one other uh, Twin Peaks in Florida. Right. Um, they had the same thing to where they would have to tell somebody that they're not as tone or they need to tone up a little bit. They didn't really say it in the, you need to lose weight factor. Um, but they would do it sometimes. It wasn't as bad, I feel like. Um, also, the managers there were just different. Um, the way that they would say things to the girls that worked there, um, it was direct, but it was kind. And they appreciated their employees. And they went above and beyond. If they were feeling bad, they would try to figure out how to help them. Mm -hmm, Whereas mm -hmm. the one that I worked at over here... Um, they wouldn't even try to say it as like polite or they wouldn't even try to say it as anything other than you're getting fat. And the manager, when girls would come in and apply, he would even say like, Oh, that girl's chubby. She's fluffy <sighs> or like stuff like that. You know yeah. what I mean? So I mean, I know these things happen. I I'm, I'm not, I am not naive. I know that these things happen. It's just, it's so upsetting to hear that so much emphasis was placed on your body size. And that's why I'm so grateful that you're telling this story because like 
this did not end with the Playboy Bunnies, with the Playboy Club or the Pan Am stewardesses. Uh, it's still happening now. Yeah. And I, and I think too, I'm such an advocate for if you feel empowered to show your body and love your body, then I totally think that you should do that. And I sure. support I support women who love their body and show it if they want to. And I'm happy that I gained confidence from working there um, mm-hmm. in some aspects. But I think there comes a point to like, how is it possible for people to say that to their employees? Yeah. Or yeah. even to like models. I know that they have body image issues throughout. Um, so signing a waiver as a model, you almost like you feel for what they go through because I'm sure yeah. that they deal with it all the time. And it's just like, how, how can you look at yourself in the mirror and say that to somebody that works for you and that is loyal to the brand? Yeah. So. And it, and it destroys your mental health. You know, we've yeah. already talked about how you went to therapy and I'm so glad that you did. And, and and in my own, in my own situation, my own toxic workplace situation, you know, it when these things happen, it doesn't matter how good you are at your job. You were so good at your job, and when you have a toxic boss, they don't care. They don't. They that's not what they want to see. They only want to see what they care about. Okay. And in many cases, it's extremely twisted. Yeah. And that's why I'm such an advocate for telling these stories. Yeah. Do you know if there's been any improvement there? Have you heard any stories? Are you in touch with anyone? Oh, oh yeah. I've heard stories. It got okay. worse. It did? Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. In, in a different yeah. aspect. They had hired on um, – they had hired on a new manager and um, basically he – fired the entire Hispanic uh, kitchen staff and oh. bar staff. Oh, good Lord. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. It did, yeah, it, it, it did get worse. <laughs> oh, yeah. my Lord. Yeah, there was a yeah. strike that was going on mm-hmm. for a while. Um, and then he was like the same manager that they had hired on was like yelling at some of the staff members. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, it got worse a lot after I left. So I was partially very happy that I got out of that before yeah. um, it continued to kind of just plummet, yeah. but also felt really bad for sure. everybody else that actually had to deal with it. Yeah. I mean, I know you touched about, you touched on this a little bit, but I'll just, I'll just ask you the question directly. Um, Cause I ask myself this question still every day. Why did it take you seven years to leave? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think I was in denial for a long time. Um, And I also partially thought like, this is what I signed up for. Mm -hmm. You know, you sign up to be a model, you sign up for them to tell you um, that you're getting weight, but yeah. um, Nobody should feel that way though. I mean, I I get it. I get it. But yeah. Yeah. That's why we're talking about this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's affected me. Even to this day, I've been gone for about three years now. Um, mm-hmm. So, but it still hits hits close to home whenever I see somebody talk about toxic workplace. And and so, um, I think those two reasons were the main ones. Mm-hmm. Also, just comfortability. I made sure. a lot of money there, and oh, yeah. And and I was afraid. I kept on applying to places after I left. Nobody would hire me, and then I would go on an interview and. Um, it seemed just as toxic as what I had left. And I just, I was not having an easy time of finding a way out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so let's uh, now move over to the more positive uh, aspect of your story, which is uh, your current career. And how did you end up uh, where you're working now? And how is it different? from Twin Peaks, Twin yeah. Peaks, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like I mentioned, I went through this really hard time of trying to find jobs and applying mm-hmm. and having bad interviews. And um, I basically, I didn't want to look at any internships because I needed something to supplement the income that I was making. 
Um, and about three months went by, still didn't find anything. I didn't, I was out of work. I wasn't making any money and it was stressing me out. I was, I was, I think the most depressed I've ever been, um, Mm -hmm. because it was putting added pressure in my head on my significant other, although Mm -hmm. they were fine with it and very supportive. Um, you feel like, like an extra burden, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. And of course that just comes with a, a long life full of depression and anxiety, but, sure. um, yeah. <laughs> yes. um, but, uh, finally I, uh, found this internship to mm-hmm. apply to. And I just said, I guess I'm just going to start applying internships and see what I can come up with. And, um, I applied to this one mm-hmm. and, um, it was as a marketing specialist intern and, um, they hired me after the first interview and I came in and I was so shy, uh, <laughs> so shy, but I knew that I wanted to prove to them that I was worth the risk of not really having that much experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they hired me on fully after three months and um, they were giving me a lot of incentives. They were teaching me and providing knowledge and they wanted to get personal in terms of having team lunches and getting to know each other and doing team building exercises. Like I've never experienced anything like that before in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that the main difference. Nurturing. That's the word that's coming to mind here. What a nurturing environment. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what it was. And they were just so understanding and open and honest about who they were and Mm -hmm. what they wanted from an employee. And they obviously have never commented on (laughs) my weight or anything (laughs) like that. Um, And even in the beginning, they were super, super good at crediting where credit is due. Mm -hmm. Like, really valuing their employees. And I see it the way that, you know, still to this day, how we all treat each other. It's just, it's, it's very different being in it versus what I was previously in. And, Mm -hmm. um, so they kept on giving me incentives and finally I was getting promotions. I was getting raises. I was getting everything that I thought that I should have gotten, Mm -hmm. but I never, got anything close to it in my previous one. And mm-hmm. um, so much so that I went from being an intern to now managing, managing our business unit within three years. Like that's. Congratulations. Ridiculous. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but that, that just goes to show you too, though, that like the right company, the right place not only will improve your mental health to where you really want to strive for the best and, so that you succeed, but they'll put belief in you. Like they'll, they'll make you believe in yourself because they believe in you so much. And I think that that's just, it's hard to find, which is the sad part of it. There are too many toxic workplaces and not enough workplaces that really give you what you need mentally. You know what I mean? Um, Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I'm here. That's wonderful. I'm so happy to hear that. So to help our listeners, uh, because you've been on both sides of the coin, um, I'd love to hear from you what you would deem red flags of a toxic environment and examples of what makes a healthy work environment. Okay. Um, Let's think. So for red flags... I would say that um, workplaces that maybe aren't very communicative with what they need from you, but still expect you to know exactly what you're doing. Oh, the old read my mind (laughs) trick. That's my business motto. I can't read your mind. (laughs) Yes. Yes. (laughs) That is, that is definitely one red flag. Um, Yeah. I've been in a couple instances. I've been in hospitality all my life. So a lot of it has been restaurants, but um, I've done like some side internships throughout the years. And, and some of it has been like that, that I've seen. Um, Another one that I'll see is um, honestly just not really being kind to each Mm -hmm. other Mm -hmm. or 
or ignoring each other, um, like ignoring messages if someone reaches out or just really not being understanding, not even caring about your employees, not asking about how they are. Um, that's going to be another one that I see. And I mean, it's kind of hard to see once you're, unless you're in it. Yeah. So from an interview perspective, um, say for like, if someone was trying to gauge it from when they first interviewed at a place, I would say maybe, maybe just, it's, it's so weird to describe. It's just like a feeling that you get in like the questions that they ask you and how they ask them. Trust your gut. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's exactly. Um, I've, I've been in a couple situations where I've interviewed and the way that they ask questions is a bit condescending. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so if you get any questions that seem that kind of way, I would say to run away. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you're saying this because um, if I might point out a little bit of a generational difference here, um, you're a Gen Z, I'm baby, I'm baby Gen X. And growing up, I was taught to just accept, 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 accept. And I love hearing that if you think someone is being condescending, don't even give them a moment more of, of your time. And it's something that I am learning later in life, but there's no time like the present. So thank you for saying that. Yeah, I, de- I think that we're in a time right now to where we have the option to really choose the type of career that we want. Yes. And yes. we're prioritizing our happiness and our well-being over just choosing a career, which is nice. Absolutely. I mean, it was, it was, um, when I left Rolling Stone, um, you know, the people around me were hesitant. I mean, my husband wanted me to do it because he just saw how miserable I was, but everyone else around me, my parents, they're boomers, you know, my friends or fellow Gen Xers, maybe elder millennials, like we had never considered, like, wait wait a minute, wait wait, wait, wait a minute. We need to prioritize our mental health. We have to (laughs) think about how this is affecting us in the long term it was a it was a novel concept even 10 years ago yeah yeah and i've taken it and i've run with it <laughs> <laughs> good i hope we all decide to keep running with it exactly exactly and so yeah i'd love to just hear some examples of from your experience of what makes a good healthy working environment yes um so my biggest thing going into this was just finding the right culture. So mm-hmm. um, some of the biggest green flags that I noticed were um, them introducing themselves, but talking about their family in a way that was very nurturing, back mm. to that word, um, very open. Um, and the way that they were asking questions almost seemed gentle. Okay. Um I know that's kind of like hard to gauge how should I best put my voice as gentle, but um, they just seemed very kind versus like the condescending tone that you would get normally. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes a huge difference. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, And then while I was in it, Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that mistakes were thought of as the whole team. It wasn't just one person that they're blaming, right? Interesting. Um, It all it all starts with like leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest green flags that I've seen because the way that it's pre- presented, like it's, it's correct. Like we all do work together. We're mm-hmm. a small, um, a small startup office. So, yeah. I mean, we need to be there for each other and we need to communicate with each other. And that's always been very transparent throughout the entire time that I've been here. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are, those are a couple green flags embedded into one. Yeah, absolutely. No, those are great examples. Thank you so much. And then what advice would you give to someone who is still in a toxic work environment? The advice I would give is to surprise yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, You might think that you can't leave. You Mm -hmm. might have your long list of reasons of why you're staying, but if you don't leave, you'll never know how much happier you can be. Yes. Yes. 
Uh, wonderful. And finally, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to provide uh, ways that listeners can connect with you, social media, if you have a website. Yeah. Um, so we do have social media. So so my travel company is like a short-term vacation rental uh, mm-hmm. company, uh, very similar to like Airbnb and Verbo, um, mm-hmm. but it's more localized. So mm-hmm. we have three websites. Um, it's floridapanhandle.com, mm-hmm. hawaiianislands.com, and smokymountains.com. Um, and so those are our websites. If you guys want to book a vacation rental, that's amazing. We, I hope you have a great time. Um, you can reach out to me, the help at smokymountains.com. I handle all the customer service too. Okay. Um, so I can help whoever uh, plan a special mental health retreat or whatever they want. Um, but as far as social media goes, we have social media for all of those three websites, a Facebook and Instagram. And then um, I also have my personal LinkedIn, um, okay. which is under Brittany Betts. Okay, no problem. I will leave links to all of those in the show notes. Okay, Brittany, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us. And I know that they're going to help our listeners because like I've been saying the whole time, uh, these stories do need to be told. And uh, we really do need uh, more awareness about uh, toxic workplaces. So thank you again. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Brittany Betts on Emotional Abuse is Real. If you would like to connect with Brittany, I've left links to her LinkedIn page as well as her company's websites in the show notes. If you would like to be a guest on the podcast, please don't hesitate to reach out via email at hello at sereneleadsrights.com or through Instagram at sereneleadsrights or fill out my guest application form. Please note that this podcast should not be used as a substitute for professional mental health services. If you are a victim of emotional abuse and need help, please call or text the Suicide and Crisis Hotline at 988 or call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. You can also text START, S-T-A-R-T, to 887-88. Once again, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Follow me on Instagram and go grab my free download, 10 Things I Learned from Getting Paid to Watch TV. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.